What is really going on here? You're never going to find out from the media. Congratulations, Trumperinos! Take the day off, then get back to work! <laughs> hey, I've been holding on to some good news just for this occasion. That uh, being Trump winning the election, that is, as of January, it will be the first time since Bush Sr., or maybe even Reagan, or over 30 years, at least 20 years if it's actually Bush, that the president will not be a lawyer. Isn't that great news? I think it is. Welcome to Fix the Media. We are really in our stride now. And you know what? I had thought about guests again. You know, actually, we do have guests coming up, um, and, we'll, and I'll get to that. I'm actually... Uh, Still working on getting one particular person who I mentioned before. I won't jinx it by mentioning them again. Um, and also, uh, I've now decided I should uh, contact Tim Kelly and see if he would be gracious enough to allow me to kind of, uh, you know, switch roles or switch chairs or switch Skype accounts or whatever so that I can interview him because he's a fascinating guy. I want to talk about what... Uh, I listened to uh, just now one of his more recent uh, podcasts. It's fascinating. He, he's it, it's definitely interesting times. Anyway, so welcome uh, to Fix the Media. My name is Peter Klein. This is a production of uh, IMS Independent Media Solidarity. We are an independent um, journalist collective, and we've got big plans. And not just this, but other things as well. So, uh, and also thank you very much to Ed Opperman at the Awake Radio Network and Joe at On Air Radio Network and our new station. At least we're being played, I think, twice, maybe three times a day, uh, beginning, I think, a couple days ago, or we will be coming up uh, as of this uh, program, or maybe tomorrow. And that's uh, FPRN Radio. So thank you, uh, Ryan, uh, for that. It's a great opportunity. That's actually also a, a, a great podcast aggregate. Uh, but please go to fixthemedia.com. And while you're, while you're there, uh, send me an email or send an email to Peter Darren Klein at Gmail. That's right. Peter Darren, as in Bobby Darren, Klein at Gmail.com. And, uh, send me some money, uh, you know, cash money, not, you know, none of the change stuff, uh, you know, uh, no coupons, 30 cents off shake and bake, you know, I don't know, you can keep it, uh, I need cash money. And this is for me personally, or rather for, uh, this program and for the work I do at TNN. And I don't know if you've been to my channel on YouTube lately, but, uh, you know, what I put up may seem like, well, you know, we, he's doing a weekly podcast and he's doing some videos in between, but there's more than that. God, you've got to understand it was, you know, what I have, I have literally about 40 ongoing projects at any given time. I'm going to just let the cat out of the bag and tell you that there is more Sandy Hook work that I'm personally working on and that IMS is working on. And this one is uh, really bizarre out of left field. Nobody knows about this. I mean, there are maybe a couple of people out there outside of IMS that knows what's going on. Uh, the Sandy Hook perpetrators are exploiting children as part of a 
propaganda program of some kind. It may be that they're ramping up for something bigger, but very slowly and deliberately over the past couple years, they've been instructing, I can only assume, and I think it's very uh, reasonable to conclude, that they are instructing children to produce videos about Sandy Hook, describing it as a tragedy and some other things. And it's really, it's, it's so messed up that I immediately knew something was bad. And luckily, one of our guys uh, at IMS has been keeping tabs, has some very creative searches going on all the time, so that when something like this comes up, we're apt to find it and identify it. And I'm telling you right now, there are dozens of these that I have found, that I have collected, and that's not all of them. There are a few that I missed. I'll have to get in touch with this gentleman to make sure I have every one because I want the research, uh, the analysis to be complete. And I don't know what to do with it. We're going to put it out to you guys. Uh, but that's for another show. And that's just one of the projects we're working on. Like I said before, I believe in the last podcast, sometimes I spontaneously go off on research binges, sometimes for a full day. I know I mentioned one the other day about just, uh, you know, corrupt police in Newtown. It was an 11 hour research binge. And other times I do projects that will last for weeks and then it gets put into the, you know, back burner file uh, or folder. And I've got so many of these things that it's, it's absolutely, and I have to go back and review them quite frequently just to make sure that I'm not crazy. And of course, we're working on our big project, uh, I guess, relative to, uh, you know, the other projects we're working on. Of course, fixing the media is a, is a, is a, the pinnacle, the, uh, the absolute uh, capstone project, if you will, right? Not to use a phrase. All right. I'll stop using it. But, um, this program, though, uh, at least half of the program, I want to talk about this, uh, Trump thing. <laughs> you know, congratulations, right? I mean, I'm just assuming that people are, down with uh, the program here. In other words, Trump is in, and if it's 5% better than Hillary, if it's 500% better than Hillary, the fact is it's better than Hillary, and better is better than not better. See what I'm saying? So it is marginally, at minimum, a better scenario. And in fact, I, I, that's why I'm doing this program. I was very surprised that uh, I had these feelings the other day. I'll tell you what I did. I actually slept in yesterday, Tuesday. I'm sorry. Yes, yesterday, Tuesday, because I'm doing this program Wednesday this time. And what I decided to do after I, because I'd been up a little late, and uh, yesterday I went ahead and just let the day go and got up late. I literally avoided media completely. I had no contact with news of any kind, and I let the day go. I worked. Um, I tidied up around here. I made sure not to see anything at all on the internet. So nothing even independent news related, never checked my, uh, my phone, uh, and anyway, or email. And basically at 3 a.m. this morning, in other words, around the time that I think it had been, you know, it wasn't that long before that, that it was announced. Uh, anyway, I turn on, I want to hear it on the radio, like old time radio style, right? FDR wins by our... Anyway, so I did that, and the first channel that it found was actually NPR. You know, hi, this is Robert Siegel. Everyone on the program has a Jewish last name, but we sound very, I guess, waspish. I'm kidding. Kidding. But anyway, so I'm listening to NPR, and what do I hear? I hear uh, some leftists kind of... Oh, you know, pondering, what was it that exactly, how will Trump, you know, I, I'm afraid. Trump was a fear-based candidate, right? He was creating a lot, he was instilling a lot of fear, a lot of concern, worry, fear, division, and all of that. And I'm just now, now that he's won, I'm very divided and fearful. <laughs> you know, this is the lefty liberal. I am great, and my ideas are good, yours bad. So let's have a debate or discussion in which I am obviously going to have to slap you or turn over the chessboard. Anyway, so it was clear that Trump had won. And then within minutes, he went right to Trump's uh, acceptance speech, which was just shocking. It was really, well, let's just say I don't listen to many political speeches, if any. I probably listened to no more than 20 to 30 seconds of any Trump 
uh, speech or whatever the hell, or or slur or misogynist uh, <laughs> catcall or whatever the hell uh, he, he was implied to have uh, to done over time. But at, at any rate, I don't really get into it. I heard this, and it really was interesting. It seemed to me like, wow. First of all, it was not like I had heard Trump before. It certainly didn't sound like the way these uh, lefty liberals described him. And he was just very, it sounded honest. And I don't know what to tell you. Look, he's already in, so I'm not shilling for Trump. I'll tell you right now, I don't have any faith in the system. So let's just say forget it, right? Like I say, even if it's a 5%, you know, uh, besting of Hillary. And you remember what's going on. We've got Hillary who was about ready to take over the, the country and she could barely walk. She was all cross-eyed and having seizures everywhere she went. And she's also into, you know, things like, oh, I don't know. She's into it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, uh, well, I'm just going to say she's into like murder, which is, you know, to me, it's, it's appalling. And of course, with these leaks, we've learned some other things, which we're not so sure about. But you know what? I don't know whether, I don't want to, I don't want to go out on a limb and say that Hillary has been involved in things like, uh, child abuse and pedophilia, that kind of stuff. But I think it's fair to say that Hillary is involved in a number of murders. I'm just going to go with what we know. So murder, yes. Pedophilia and child abuse, not yet sure. So anyway, about, uh, I guess back, back in April, I read, uh, I wrote a paper called A New President, Think Again America, which breaks down the American population rather than breaking down the candidates. So it was kind of a, you know, a switcheroo there. But, it, it, you know, I, I wanted to say, this is a very good article. It's not written very well. It's written by me, but it's edited by one of our IMS members, Scott Anthony. Thank you to him. It will likely be your introduction to the RK selection theory, which is fascinating. It's actually, it's, it's potentially a genetic physiological explanation for why some are some people are conservative and others are leftists. Seriously, it's a mind blower. It might be a means to shut down anyone's leftist rhetoric before they can even get started, really, because this goes all the way. It kind of cuts right through all the crap, cuts right through the issues and goes to the core of the background or the reason they, you know, these leftist folks may not themselves know. Anyway, so we're going to do that. That's going to be the other half of uh, this thing. I want to say also, I was listening to some of this stuff that was being said as I continued to work. Uh, I couldn't help but listen to on the radio, which I never really do, but I was listening to uh, Kai Rizdog or whatever the heck his name is. And, oh, you know, uh, Kitty Gutenberg. And anyway, uh, one of the points they were making, they made a few funny ones. Um, but some were kind of interesting and enlightening. And you could tell that the wind was out of their sails. And they were deciding, it was almost as if they had decided, you know what, we better start seeding our dialogue with a little bit of, I told you so, or I knew it all along. Or, you know what, I knew Trump had something there. There was something going on. I knew those polls were a little bit off. You know what I mean? They're hedging their bet. But they're not pushing it too far. So you got to hand it, you know, hand it to them. Um, some of them were barely able to hold back their rage. You know, they were trying very hard to not just, you know, shout out, uh, Trump is the devil. Uh, but they said, they mentioned that uh, college educated people, men and women, might have skewed the polls by lying that they were about their, you know, ha intending to vote for Trump, which I thought was hysterical because they thought, wow, it's like a privilege they had. You know, they thought, you know what, I'm just going to lie to these pollsters because, you know, I'm a college-educated person and that's my right to kind of protect my, um, you know, my class, the prestige, my education, because they get so little else from it. It was basically the first time that they got anything out of their nebulous communications degree from Stanford, right? <laughs> They're still paying on it, tens of thousands. Or over a hundred thousand. Oh boy. Because Trump has won in a race where Dems were so divisive, now we get to look forward to the celebrities who've promised to leave the country. Do you remember that? Ha <laughs> ha. 
If you're on the TNN or IMS YouTube account, or if you're at FixTheMedia.com, post a comment and tell us uh, which celebrities swore to leave the country. Uh, because I can't remember any specifics, but I just recall that that was something that was going around. A couple people had mentioned this type of thing. Well, maybe a Michael Moore or something. Now, I, I, if it was him, that's great, but I'm not sure. So let us know. I'd be extra pleased, by the way, to see some on my celebrity boycott list, which is, if you don't know, everyone who appeared in that Every Town for Gun Safety ad that came out about a week after Newtown. Isn't that coincident? That's just an amazing coincidence. I don't know how long it takes to produce a, uh, you know, a celebrity laden with 20 to 30 celebs all able to appear within, well, just a few days' time, because then they have to produce the video, and, you know, they have to conceptualize it, produce it, the whole thing, but a week after Newtown, bam, there it is, you know? Kind of like those shirts in Aurora, in Aurora uh, was it Aurora? Um, no, 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 it was, uh, no, that's right, it was Arizona. That was the Jared Loeffler, Gabby Giffords, Safeway shooting um, uh, yeah, but anyway, they came out with the t-shirts there within, I think, I can't recall for sure, but I think it was five days total turnaround time from, you know, bam, bam, you know, from Jared Loeffner, the insane, uh, you know, lone gunman, right? Wherever the hell he is, right? Um, <laughs> is if he's ever going to see the light of day, whether he's underground or above ground, dead, Six feet under uh, at a Supermax. I think he's at the Supermax there in Colorado. Is what they claim, just like all these other guys. And if you're there, you ain't ever getting out because none of those people have a parole hearing upcoming. It's a very special prison for very special, horrible, well, statists uh, who really like to do this kind of stuff. You know, oh yeah, they're bad guys. Well, okay, fine. Put the bad guys in, you know, some kind of a program of some kind killing them i don't know you guys decide i let the i let the pop the, you know if you're willing to go get a guy hang him up and string him you know that's you know your community effort it's not my bag i'm going to oppose it uh, but i'm certainly not going to prevent a community from taking care of business in the fought in the style that uh, they deem you know as a community i say community because it, you know i don't want to exclude anyone like two or three or five or ten people or or a hundred people or a town or something from uh doing what they desire to do because the state has no right in uh encroaching unless someone's agreed to do so and then it's a whole different thing anyway uh marvel at the government that just won't come clean i know steve poppet was talking about doing a cop on cops special show to congratulate all the Trump voters. Uh, he wants to make sure that, you know, since everyone he hears is always whining about how everybody, everything's corrupt, that people don't suddenly drop all the work they're doing because King Donald is now going to clean house. Or maybe he just wants to laugh at them, <laughs> thinking one rich guy could reverse all that corruption. Which, hey, you know what? I see his point. But, uh, Let's hope that he uh, gets crushed by a birdbath on his way to do that. No, I'm kidding. He's a good guy. He's a good guy. Sleeps in a uh, hermetically sealed plastic container, believe it or not. He's a wild one. Uh, oh, I wanted to say this, too. If I were to talk with the Republican conservative Donald Trump, now that he's president, I would tell him, Go nuts, man, with favoring business and deregulation. Deregulate everything. But there's a tiny twist. Oh, and by the way, let these corp uh, corporations pollute to their heart's content, right? Monsanto the crap out of everything. But there's a tiny twist. And I do mean tiny. There are three Supreme Court justices, I think, that are in their 80s, or at least, if not in their 80s, they're, you know, 79, you know, that type of thing, 80, 80, 80, whatever. And it's possible that one or more will retire or otherwise need to be replaced. We've already got Scalia to replace. So my guess is the next two Supreme Court justices will be conservative because they'll be coming in under this now Republican 
dominated, uh, well, government, including Trump, because, you know, they're, well, here's the thing. In other words, we're at risk of a ruling that DynCorp can practice pedophilia as a corporation because they're too big to fail or something. You know what I'm saying? Just basically some kind of horrendous, you know, stop the vote. Uh, state must intrude. Marijuana is a class A narcotic drug that must never be, that we must ruin people's lives over, despite the fact that states are declaring it medicine. And so here's the thing I was saying. I would tell, yeah, I would tell Donald Trump, yeah, go ahead, do whatever you're going to do. Supreme Court justices, knock yourself out. Let the corporations, um, you know, rule. So um, I tell anyone planning to let corporations of the government pollute the planet with abandon that, that's fine. But the stipulation is that no corporation can report the news and accept advertiser revenue. Oh, what? Uh, oh, really? Is that? Oh, oh, see, now, Peter, hold on. That's not, because see, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, no, that's the deal. It's a, it's a separate class of corporation. It's called the free press. When you're a member of the free press, you forfeit your right, not your right as a citizen to do or as a corporation outside of this endeavor, this free press participation. But when you're doing the work of the press, you cannot as a corporation, accept advertiser revenue, right? And there are probably a few other kind of very fundamental rules, but do you see where this is going? And that's going to be, a, a, we'll have a lot of people objecting to that right up front, thinking that's too far. How can you do that? And what will the world now? Just trust me on this one. And advertiser revenue, by the way, is, uh, this is just the beginning because that's not necessarily going to touch on the entertainment media so much as the free press being, you know, the news media. But I think it will, if we could get that, um, view to be a popular view and then put that into place, you know, which by the way, come on. I mean, is the news, so is, is the, the, the press A supposed to be, um, selling us, uh, biased lies and deciding for us what the news is? Because I'll tell you what, here's the thing. I'm afraid that the free press is just too important to let corporations screw, up, screw it up again. After all, who's going to make sure Americans are aware of the corporate polluters and other shenanigans, right? See how that works? So that's kind of my, well, this is part of, of course, fix the media, but this is what I would tell Donald Trump and those who are concerned about a conservative, you know, uh, uh, Supreme Court and all of that. Don't you worry your pretty little Trumperino head. Also, shout out to Wolves and Sheeple, Winston Smith, uh, who was a guest. He was actually the first interview guest we had on Fix the Media, which is this show right here. My name is Peter Klein. This is an IMS production, and we are on every Thursday night at 10. And we are also going to be switching to Saturday nights, by the way. But that's just a a teaser. Um, of course, right now it's Thursday at 10. And if you're listening to this after that, well, then it's whatever time you're listening to it. Don't ask me. Check your clock. You need to get yourself a watch or something. Check your cell phone. It should have the correct time on it. Anyway, shout out to Wolves and Sheep of Winston Smith. You gotta love a guy <laughs> that refers to Anderson Cooper as, quote, that silver haired homosexual fellow. <laughs> That was just the, who is that silver haired homosexual fellow? <laughs> I knew immediately who he was talking about. <laughs> oh gosh. Perfect. Media meme hunting. There you go. When I was talking behind the scenes with Winston from Wolves and Sheeple, which go to wolvesandsheeple.com, by the way. Um, and I need to do the same. It's been a few weeks since I was actually over there. Uh, well, maybe it's been two weeks since I listened to my last podcast of his, but please go check it out. I mean, do it now while you're listening to this. Very simple. Wolvesandsheeple.com. And when you're there, just do the subscribe, subscribe. You know what? My friend QK says, you know what? Just like everything, love everything, subscribe to everything, and join everything. And you can just throw it away later if you want. But just do that. Because that's a quick and easy way to make friends, to grow your network, to be a participant, to feel like you're connected, and to connect. And of course, it's just a piece of cake easy to just go bam, 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 bam. 
if something doesn't, you know, strike your fancy, or if you suddenly get swatted by a, <laughs> if you get swatted by the lefty liberal uh, media or something, well, then you know I would unsubscribe or, or uh, unlike and block them. Someone's trying to notify me. Up, oh, Trump's been assassinated. Crap. <laughs> I'm kidding. Less than 24 hours. All right, so let's break for commercial. When we come back, I'm going to read this article I wrote back in April, which is entitled, A New President? Try Again, America. Sounds condescending, but that's not the point of it. And you'll see when we come back from commercial. Thank you very much for listening to Fix the Media. This is Peter Klein. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. Trust me. Don't do it. Back in a few. Is the FCC necessary? Self-appointed arbiters of the public good. We are the products of the media marketplace. We are sold like slaves to the likes of CBS and the New York Times. And they're not going to let their investment go to waste. You can hide it with the FCC guidelines. These aren't safety standards. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Fix the Media, an independent media solidarity production with your host, Peter Klein. Join us every Thursday at 10 p.m. on the Awake Radio Network. Okay, and we are back. Yes, you're back with Fix the Media, Peter Klein, the show that is devoted to the juggalo lifestyle. <laughs> no. ICP, man. Paint your face. They're kind of like, they remind me of Kiss in a way. Kiss is no less crazy these days. As I said before, we are going to spend the rest of the show, or at least the majority of the last half of this program, and uh, reading through an article I wrote uh, with the editing help of Scott Anthony, uh, entitled, A New President? Try Again, America. And this was actually published on Memory Hole blog back, I would assume, back in April it was when this was written. And um, I just think we'll get into it here. And you you have to, uh, I guess, decide for yourself, of course, as it being my, it being my writing style, it's pretty labored. <laughs> I wish I could, you know, be a little more cogent and a little more condensed uh, I think I'm resolved now to chop everything I write down by 50% before going into final production of anything these days. But let's dig in. It's a new president. Try again, America. By Peter Klein, Independent Media Solidarity, and Scott Anthony, Flash News Network. That's actually his site, um, and it's you can find it at flashnewsnetwork.com. It begins, reality check time. Can we get real for two minutes? The 2016 presidential race has nothing to do with the struggle to repair this broken, malignant, and disease-ridden country. You know it, and I know it, and I'm about to prove it to most people's satisfaction. My prediction of how people would react to the 2016 presidential race heating up has been very accurate. I don't usually make such predictions, however, this year I've been more interested in gauging our prospects for achieving a peaceful resolution to certain key problems than ever before. Rather than looking at political promises, key events, or various forecasts, I've been looking more carefully at the demographics of Americans to estimate those prospects. The system is so irreparably ruined by corruption, criminality, and cronyism that only an intervention by people on the outside can bring it to heel. The 2016 election will likely unfold according to the script, while Americans of all political persuasions are relegated to spectators. Which Americans have the best strategy to regain control and, as the cliché says, take our country back? The following is one possible breakdown of the American citizenry and body politic. This is what we have to deal with, the reality as I see it. And then I have a heading, uninformed slash neutral, 50%. The average American has been trending toward uninformed, with heavy, heavy reliance on their state, local, and federal government and their related agencies to fix everything for years. Based upon major media polls and research firms, it is fair to estimate that this group constitutes a majority. For the sake of this report, I have chosen to lump them in with the totally neutral, apathetic Americans, the, quote, blind following sheep, unquote, we're always hearing about. In my estimates, this combined group makes up 50% conservatively. It might seem that we're halfway to completing our breakdown. 
but from here it becomes more nuanced. Isn't it interesting that as people become more intelligent, informed, politically aware, grounded in their beliefs, and generally more complicated, they become an increasingly smaller minority? It would be a safe bet that these more informed people are better equipped to deal with a smaller peer group as well. Might these smaller groups also be inherently more conservative, have fewer children, be more competitive and more focused on the future as well? The remaining 50% of Americans might best be distinguished as actually giving a rat's ass. Although the, the degree to which they do varies considerably. For instance, a wandering Ron Paul supporter gives the most of a rat's ass, while the feminist sent by central casting, who's going to vote for Hillary solely on the basis of gender, gives only a slender but highly vocal slice of a rat's ass. But what distinction can be used to best divide this group? Would it be more accurate to divide the group simply along left-right paradigm lines? Or would some other factor or characteristic outweigh this entrenched partisanship? This is not to say that liberalism and conservatism as generally defined don't exist, as they certainly do. However, we will need to redefine them in very new and different ways and may even have identified a revolutionary, biological, or even evolutionary explanation for these fluent ideologies and some of the changes that exist within them currently. I've thought for years now that the appearance of a vast difference between our two political parties was thinner than a wet slice of single-ply toilet tissue paper. If one were to review the actual voting records, platform stands, and talking points, one might discover that there is no significant difference at all. Once one gets past rhetoric and scare tactics, the establishment starts to look a lot more like some as-yet-undiscovered secret club. Let's call it Jerk and Jester. And then I have a Jerk and Jester logo I created. It's very uh, <laughs> ominous looking. It actually has a guy winking on the center of it. It has two twin towers that are uh, kind of phallic in appearance that are both wearing top hats. It's encoded with some terminology. For instance, it reads in one place, Kanye. <laughs> Kanye, what a guy. He's the artist, man. Let me tell you. Whew. And then it, of course, has its kind of Latin, um, I'm not sure what to call this. It's the slogan, Shiliduta Idiotrol Ore Espankidus. <laughs> you figure it out. I'll continue. In doing some in-depth research, I have concluded that there is one factor that overwhelmingly determines a person's political ideology or general personality. For the sake of this report, let's call this group the creative thinking or imaginative thinking people. These two thought processes also involve how a person views the world, whether they do so in a unidimensional or multidimensional fashion. In short, it seems that creative thinking people tend to think multidimensionally, for the sake of argument, let's assume this is better. Next section is Creative Conspiracy Politics, a further breakdown. What really firmed up my theory was what I noticed about authors of both fiction and nonfiction. I've never been all that interested in fiction. I've long thought that the reason for this was, as a creative person, I don't require creative training wheels. I see our collective reality and our vast history as being far more exciting and interesting than any fictional construct. By writing this, I mean no offense to the brilliant writers of fiction, or even those who may maybe aren't so brilliant at it, to each their own. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? My working theory is that some writers of fiction are so horribly lacking in creativity that they become authors in an effort to either build some, or at least build the persona of a creative individual, even if they aren't. It is actually quite depressing when one thinks about it. However, Taking a look at what mass publishers try to pass off as exceptionally well-written fiction, one can't help but wonder just how shallow the creative well is, with many an author of the next bestseller. I digress, rather than go too far into this area. Let's circle back to uh, how best to divide the remaining group of Americans. Creativity is the ability to form new images and sensations in the mind that are not perceived through the senses. Imagination is the potential of one's creative ability, but doesn't actually require that someone be creative. That is to say, imagination may or may not involve the creation of something new. It often doesn't. It is sufficiently imaginative to consider or imagine a scenario that may even be a cliché. So long as it is uncommon or atypical, your thinking is imaginative. 
Simply having an open mind generally requires a well-developed imagination. If you happen to be creative as well as having an open mind, consider this a whopping bonus. The downside, just being imaginative doesn't guarantee that you're right in your thinking or any conclusions you may draw upon any inferences. Now consider imagination and creativity as it relates to what some have coined as conspiracy theory. This popular term is unnecessarily narrow and doesn't fit all people with a conspiracist ideology. I'm well versed in conspiracy theory, yet I don't develop many. Maybe a better term to describe myself would be conspiracy considerate. It's significant to note when a major event or phenomenon is viewed by many as a possible act of deception. Other type of cover-up or the given details are contradictory, one can reasonably conclude it may involve conspiracy. When viewing an event as a pol potential conspiracy, there's no automatic Ocean's Eleven-like theory resulting from it. It remains largely a mystery, from my experience. Some element of blame lies with most authorities' widespread practice of concealing whatever details they choose, preventing us from forming a deeper and more comprehensive understanding of events. Today, there is a larger-than-ever number of Americans who would label themselves truthers or otherwise self-identify as awake. Some are admittedly believers in conspiracies perpetrated by the U.S. government. Others strongly suspect that the government is plagued by corruption and malfeasance, but have little to no suspicion of larger conspiracies. Given time, I think many will come to an agreement that greater conspiracies are taking place and the level of corruption is at critical levels. Of those that don't share these views, many still share anti-capitalist, anti-corporate, environmental, or anti-war views that are nearly as radical as the conspiracy theorists and nearly as revolutionary imaginative. Next section, the other half, the smaller parts of the pie. And the uh, we now move to what reads statist left, 17%. <clears throat> In researching further, I found that the next fundamental division within the American body politic is between statists and anti-statists. Statist just happens to be one of those rare words that Google claims not to know how to spell. The statists exist on both sides of the left-right paradigm. Their ignorance of the paradigm is possibly a symptom of their support of the state and all its claims. Although they're largely just acting out roles, the current presidential candidates or their characters are all statists. A fair assessment is that the statist left makes up the second largest segment of the American body politic. Not coincidentally, it also appears to be the largest segment of politically active people. Yet their motivations are entirely antithetical to the goals most Americans share. It isn't clear that their motivations aren't actually demonic or at least wholly destructive. This group comprises those who are both blind to the obvious failings and criminality of the state, as well as those that are entirely aware of it. The important distinction is that they all support the state at all costs. There's a little known but highly popular new idea shaking up political science. As stated prior, there is an explanation for what might account for the universal polarity in politics, the left and the right. There may be a reasonable explanation for what gives rise to a liberal versus a conservative and better ways to define them both. The new idea is rooted in RK selection theory. To broach this topic requires a quick overview. Don't worry, this is all very interesting, and very easy to grasp quickly. Here are two short quotes from the website anonymousconservative.com. Quote, if you provide a population with free resources, those who will come to dominate the population will exhibit five basic traits called an R-selected reproductive strategy competition and risk avoidance, promiscuity, low investment single parenting, early age of sexualization of young, and no loyalty to in-group, unquote. And the next quote is, quote, the K-selected reproductive strategy where resources are scarce, competition for resources ev is everywhere, and some individuals will die due to failure in competition, and the resultant resource denial that this produces this produces the case strategy, which is best seen in the wolf. This strategy also has five psychological traits. Competitiveness, aggressiveness, protectiveness, mate monopolization monogamy, high investment two-parent child rearing, 
later age of sexualization of young and high loyalty to in-group. This psychology is destined, or I'm sorry, is designed to form highly fit and competitive groups that succeed in group competition, all while capturing and monopolizing the fittest mate possible, as a means of making their offspring genetically fitter than those of competitors." Unquote. The RK selection theory had previously been a subject of research limited to evolutionary ecology. I'm very curious just how long it took before someone began to apply the theory to politics. It does seem to be a comprehensive and deeply rooted explanation for liberals versus conservatives. One could easily apply this theory to events such as the mass shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School in New Newtown, Connecticut. The Sandy Hook event appears to have very strong R-selection ties as, as to who may have motivated it, the goals of the perpetrators, and the politics of the characters visibly carrying it out. The key thing to remember about the statist left, in my opinion, is that it is likely the group most responsible for the problems affecting the world today, and probably throughout recorded history. Learning about what may be deeper biological and evolutionary causes for the group's R-selection tendencies can only reinforce one's belief that this is a factual observation. And the next section, statist right 10%. The statist right does not exclude those with R-selection tendencies, but is made up largely of people with K-selection tendencies. But recall that both left and right statists are supporters of the state. However, the statist right is far less likely to support the collectivist mindset of the left and largely rejects socialist-oriented policies. In this group, I would suggest our folks like neocon middle managers. The lords of neoconservatism are almost surely left-leaning statists, but their subordinates are typically people who simply enjoy the authority that the state affords them. Were they to have no experience or prospects of working within the state, they might think otherwise. However, this group is still dangerous, as any group that favors unjust and unwarranted violence or respect for authority, I'm, I'm sorry, respect for anonymous authority can be. One only needs to think of Eric Prince or Jack Welsh. Those in the statist right are prone to achieve upper management roles using methodologies that sociopaths generally employ. What is perceived by non-sociopaths as gutsy decisiveness or coolness under pressure is quite often just a lack of concern for others and irrational arrogance. Thankfully, this group is relatively small and isn't nearly as conniving or deceptive as the left variety. At this point, you can probably tell this is not a personal analysis of the U.S. government or the machinations of the system. What is being analyzed and dissected is the citizenry itself. There is good reason to suspect that there's probably little to no chance that the government will do anything to improve our situation. To the contrary, it's almost more reasonable to predict it will continue to worsen and may even self-destruct. In the next section, anti-statist left, 10%. A largely under, understated but important subgroup, and one I have much respect for, is the anti-statist left. This group is driven by many of the same motivations of the statist left, but elects to achieve goals fairly and without trampling upon the rights of others. One can only imagine the amount of moral fortitude it, to choose not to cheat when the most effective cheating tools are within your grasp, conveniently provided by the state. Not to mention that your peers are mostly already engaged in cheating and would very likely welcome with open arms and any anti-status left to join in the status left gravy train. Why this group is relatively large in numbers, despite the inherent contradiction, is possibly because anti-authoritarianism, opposition to the state, is currently more popular than ever. Considering all of this, it can be assumed that some people in this group have, and likely will, defect and join the status right. In my opinion, this is a very plausible evolutionary path. However, it's a move in the right, no pun intended, direction. Actually, I think I did intend the pun there. I'm certain many liberals likely would disagree, yet I don't expect that any would actually present any convincing arguments to the contrary. Yes, in a nutshell, I'm saying that I'm right and they are wrong on this particular topic. In the next section, anti-statist right, 10%. If I were to make a prediction as to which group might ultimately make or break achie achievement of the shared goals of the American people, it's this one. Numbering roughly 10% is a little misleading because this group technically includes the 3% of creative pioneers. 
Spoiler alert, creative pioneers are anti-statist right in political ideology for the most part. We haven't gotten to creative pioneers, by the way, yet. That's the last group here. But just because someone in, is right-leaning or conservative doesn't require that they support a suppressive government. They are, from my experience and within the capitalist corporate structure, supporters of freedom. Some on the left might argue that freedom has veered off into negative consequences like corporate theft of public resources or envi environmental destruction, for example. I won't fully disagree that this is one potentially accurate interpretation, with exceptions. The larger question, though, is should it be the role of government to legislate what the, rec what the recommended daily allowance of freedom should be? Many people agree the freedoms of excess might necessitate some oversight to prevent any harm it might cause. When, how, and by whom is the question, to which some suggest by default it be the government. When someone in the anti-status right supports a form of regulation or accountability, their suggestions are far less likely to include a government. In the final section, creative pioneers, 3%. Finally, we arrive at the lightest group, the creative pioneers. Examining this group shows cr clearly why it stands apart from the others, and it is from within this group that I expect to see real action to achieve our shared goals through creati creativity based on careful strategy. Not surprisingly, I consider myself part of this group. Maybe now is a good time to identify what I think our shared goals are. I personally find this an odd thing to have to do. After all, our society has existed long enough to have settled on an agreeable set of goals to achieve our wants and conditions in which to live, hasn't it? For some of us, at least, it's not a matter of knowing what we want, but remembering it often enough for it to shape our lives. Imagine inviting a group of co-workers or neighbors over to ask each a simple, general question. What do you want? My guess is that most will be stumped initially. However, soon the answers they give will be very revealing. Money will probably be one of the first answers to emerge. Possibly a villa in the south of France might be given as a response. Consumerist sur mer. Given enough time, the responses will emerge with a deeper tone after more thoughtful reflection. World peace, living forever, or perfect health are often common answers. Each time I consider that same question and the requirement that it be universal, universally applicable, my response undoubtedly ends up being love and happiness. Whether those are the most agreeable American wants isn't the point. The point being made is to avoid the pitfall of making compromises before even needing to. Collectively, as Americans, we should begin to set goals with our most wondrous and childlike mind. Then we can back away from there and settle on more realistic and sensible goals. Clearly, love and happiness aren't specific enough to be a roadmap for America's future, but they are a great place to start. Another approach to identif or in identifying our collective goals is simply to identify the biggest problems we all face. For example, it may be as simple as deciding to elect to fix our problems. The dilemma we all face is the unknown or the inability to determine what exactly they are, f our biggest collective problems. The elephant in the room is the one we could call the problem of all problems. Let me share a secret with you and it will become a bit clearer. The problem of all problems is that key information is routinely being kept from us, thus making it impossible for us to know what the real problems are. Is that too Rumsfeldian? <laughs> Does that make sense to you, or do you still doubt government secrecy is that widespread? Do you want to know a secret about secrets? I once read an estimate that for every single public document published, five others are published and made secret. Try to imagine the enormity of documents published in just the past ten, ten years alone. Apparently that vast mountain is but a mere hill as compared to the huge universe of secrets that exists, always just over the horizon and out of reach. Along similar lines, there's a problem of the press failing miserably to inform the public. What is reported can easily be deemed propaganda and totally useless as information from which to operate on or form your worldview around. What isn't deliberate deception invented by the media for whatever reason is likely a more harmful form of propaganda by government through the media. This problem isn't exclusively found in news media, but exists in all other forms of media. What was once assumed to be inflated claims in advertising is now understood to be multi-pronged deception campaigns. Sometimes they involve seemingly disparate business interests. However, 
buried deeply beneath layers of information protected by secrecy, lies the truth. For with each nugget of information the media publishes or broadcasts, there is an element of truth, with a more clandestine element of either deliberate deception or complete manipulation of the facts to craft, craft a different viewpoint by the consumer, you. There are long-established campaigns of deception dating back decades, so long that it becomes difficult to even comprehend how much harm it may be causing. American outrage exponentially declines over decades. One example is the vaccine industry. It began with the polio vaccine and continues to this very day with Obama's planned $2 billion Zika vaccine program. At no point has the true danger and ultimate purpose of these vaccines been admitted. What little has been leaked or uncovered is chilling. The responsible government agencies have been acutely accurate, I'm sorry, acutely aware of the dangers all along, and yet they've done nothing to inform the Americans. After all, the true dangers in our world are for government to know and you to find out. So it would seem that one easily identifiable goal that would surely benefit every American in many ways is to take back the news media. Does that sound familiar to anyone? The free press, as guaranteed by our Constitution, is cr a critical component of any free society. The continued operation of the present news media monopoly constitutes a clear conflict of interest. This effectively creates a news media void that American citizens must collaborate on to fill. Remember, this is an inherent, God-given right is protected by the First Amendment. The U.S. government and all 60,000-plus sub-agencies demonstrate with increasing clarity that they don't view their role as servants of the people. Whatever the cause may be, the millions of people employed by the U.S. government have failed in their duty to conduct the business of government honorably and to be responsive to the will of the people. Hopefully, at this point, we have identified two major goals shared by most Americans to return the scope and authority of the news media to the people, and to revoke the authority granted to irreparably corrupt government agencies. It's both fair and legally right. These practical, shared goals when compared to our own personal goals are complementary. It is reasonable that removing the vast veil of secrecy, allowing Americans to educate themselves about history and present affair or present affairs would greatly improve our chances of experiencing love and happiness. Simply leveling the playing field by removing the privilege of concealing government's criminality would do the same. Would you make a better president? Ask yourself this. Have you, have you heard or read any of the current presidential candidates claiming they will work with us toward achieving these goals? Have any at least addressed the problem of excessive secrecy? To my knowledge, that answer is no. Only one candidate, Donald Trump, has exposed publicly that the mainstream media is corrupt. Even still, why would any of us think there was a chance they would tackle these problems once in office and woven into the state apparatus? Let's approach the issue from a different perspective. From the present array of presidential candidates, and this, remember, was written back in April, are any capable of performing any better than the average American? Could you do a better job? What a strange question to ask. Am I simply being arrogant to ask it? Let's ask a different question then. Do you personally, personally know anyone that you think would do a better job as president than any of the current candidates? I can think of no less than a dozen. Were I to run for president, I would not make promises, but I would have a decisive position platform that I would make known. Once in office, I would work without taking a vacation during the four-year term. It is a very obvious way in which to demonstrate one's respect for and acknowledgement of the gravity of the office. I wouldn't accept gifts while in office, nor accept payment for services based solely on status once out of office. I would spend more time listening to American citizens than probably the past 10 presidents combined. I would rarely speak directly to the press. Rather, I would invite Americans to witness cabinet meetings and other activities of the administration directly. I would advise the independent press to limit their time spent reporting on press conferences where ideas are merely expressed and more time reporting on actual legislation and the voting process itself. I could go on, but you get the idea. I know you're concerned about what your friends and family would think were you to become a revolutionary. That might be because you aren't exactly sure what a revolutionary is. Do you think they are typically concerned about the approval of family and friends? If you are, are you underestimating the political savvy and common sense of your family and friends? 
Every brilliant thinker is first deemed a lunatic before their revolutionary ideas are accepted and eventually lauded. But what of your common sense and political savvy? Are you stumping for Bernie Sanders? Does his economic views or apparent appreciation of subsidized health care and equality appeal to you somehow? Or are you a fan of Donald Trump? Does his corporate experience or the possibility of running the government like a business sound like a fresh idea worth trying? Does Hillary Clinton's excessive political experience and awareness of international affairs seem to be seem to elevate her above the other candidates? Do you ever wonder why Ron Paul withdrew from the race so abruptly last time around? It's unfortunate that you'll never get that chance to ask a candidate a question like, do you think NASA may have lied about some programs or accomplishments? Neither you nor I will be able to ask, does the federal income tax apply to people who don't work for the government? Certainly we won't be allowed to make requests like, would you allow the public to audit the contract in place for telephone service at the White House? Therefore, all we know about the presidential candidates is from a few sound bites that are given to us by the establishment's PR directorate. Maybe we're just beating around the bush in the first place, since you may already suspect the president is always chosen in advance and in secret. It is only now we are learning of some of the inner secrets of both the Republican Democrat and Democrat parties with their delegate electoral process without actual citizen votes, GOP, and superdelegates to coronate a particular candidate, DNC. Are we just wasting our time and foolishly ignoring what is as obvious as the nose on our face? I suspect that this group I've labeled creative pioneers are well aware of the obvious truths and have moved past the trap of wasting time by ignoring them. You may be among this group, but realize that, to be a part of it, you must understand that the responsibility of achieving the goals I've outlined is in your hands. Attempting to motivate the other 97% to act, or even to help, is likely a fool's errand. They may even inadvertently get in the way. The creative pioneers aren't interested in the presidential race, outside of what minimal insight as political theater it might offer. Those among this group are likely to have been equally disinterested in the 2008 election, and probably suspected Obama was a well-groomed saboteur before he became the Democratic frontrunner. The creative pioneers face a daunting challenge that I doubt ever existed before in modern history. When a challenge is unique, and no template for success exists, how reasonable is it for anyone to claim to know the solution? How firmly should the solution be crafted based on our past experiences? After all, those American experiences have been largely constructed to mislead us. Even our very language has been partly crafted to curb anti-establishment ideas. I haven't written this to admonish anyone, nor do I claim to be right about everything I've postulated I'm no expert in any of the fields where it might help in this regard, like political science, government administration, or sociology, for example. To what degree can we rely upon the sciences, sciences as practiced these days anyway? Ponderology, or the science of evil, is so new as to barely be a blip on the radar. What I've written in my breakdown of the political and personality composition of Americans is, I hope, interesting and promotes further analysis and discussion. If the best assessment deemed it a joint, disjointed, and sophomoric, albeit creative, attempt to encapsulate the political and social landscape, I will be pleased. After all, I think solutions to the pretty nasty mess we're in will require creativity and imaginative thinking. I hope that you will join with other Americans, avoid the pitfall of unnecessary compromise, use your imagination, and create those solutions. Whew! <laughs> so that's it. What do you think? Good? Bad? Indifferent? Who cares? Go to hell? I love you? I hate you? <laughs> I will kill you? <laughs> Come on, please kill me. <laughs> I just love the death threat. You know, when you spend a lot of time and you write something like this, man, you know, you put your neck on the line. Oh, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. It's pretty cool. So, <laughs> it's fun. You guys should try it. Um, <laughs> and then maybe we'll, we'll all kill each other. <laughs> A little bit at a time. Death by a thousand cuts. You know? I have a really warped sense of humor, as you might be able to tell. Anyway, that's it. We're out of time. I mean, I probably went over. So I'm going to go back and chop a bunch of crap out of this thing. All my jokes about uh, undergarments and uh, anal bleaching. <laughs> uh, life in the slowest lane of all. Let's fix the media, people. Thanks. See you next time.